Hello. Am I speaking legibly? Legibly, it's an interesting pun. Um, actually, it was Brian McGuinness who was in Cambridge, unknown to me, and Jonathan Smith said, Professor McGuinness, could you look at these papers? Because some learned professor in Cambridge said they were pretty useless. So Brian said, no, the Wittgenstein stuff. Um, so get Gibson to look at them. So I was commanded to appear and did. So I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite handed, but commanded. Wittgenstein skin of manuscripts, I use the term manuscripts, could be papers. And we're going to concentrate on the pink book, but I think first we need a historical setting. That is the archive. Wittgenstein, at the point of Skinner's death, asked Skinner's father to send manuscripts back, gathered his, and selected what he wanted to send off in three bundles to Reuben Goodstein and said, um, consider these for publication. Brian McGuinness noted that, unfortunately, they were neglected all of his life, all Goodstein's life, an honorable man. Um, and I asked Brian why, and he said, well, Reuben was a man who held the cards so close to his chest, he didn't know what they contained. And that was generally the case, but about Wittgenstein. And it's obvious that he was utterly devoted to um, Skinner and Wittgenstein. S um, Skinner and Reuben Goodstein went to the same school, St. Paul's, and um, they went to different colleges. Skinner was in Trinity. And there was a certain understanding, closeness, and envy between them. All I'll say is the following. Having talked with Goodstein's daughter, who was happily married, unhappily married, uh, divorced, became a lesbian, and had that sort of relationship with her father, I'm not drawing any judgments. I'm just saying that she said, Reuben Goodstein's wife hated Wittgenstein with such vitriol, you wouldn't believe it, and had actually ripped up some stuff of Wittgenstein's at home. So Reuben forthwith kept everything in his office and then unfortunately had a stroke and was not in a position to give any attention to them. Um, it, the details of how they were preserved, I won't go into. But it's interesting to note that and without wanting to backtrack, it's important to see the severity of that situation because Reuben was a second generation Jew from Eastern Europe in the 1890s, and uh, his family um, were linked up with Jews in Manchester. And as an undergraduate, Reuben Goodstein fell in love with the wife of his uncle, and they eventually married, and that is the wife about whom we're talking. And uh, Wittgenstein tried to be principled and helpful, and the family were in a terrible situation. It is worth noting that in various bits of evidence that one puts together, you find this. Um, you, need a knee, uh, you need a meal, Reuben, or oh, good sign, um, says Wittgenstein. sign. You look as if you've got um, a vitamin deficiency. Why is this? Oh, my parents cut off all my money to try and stop me having this relationship with my girlfriend. I won't go on. I'm just saying in a very compassionate way, emigres, family, very devout, rabbinic background, etc. Um, what The girl that he married eventually, um, her, her surname was Israel, so you know what that means coming from Eastern Europe. So tragic situation. But the result is that this archive wasn't really considered at all for um, publication uh, in the sense of any operational evidence about it. Um, we can understand that Wittgenstein um, trusted Reuben. Reuben did his best in very difficult circumstances, unemployed, working in an address millinery shop in London, couldn't get a grant. Eventually, he manages to do his PhD in London. Wittgenstein is the external examiner and basically gets him a job um, at Reading. So all that, we, with sympathy, we understand this and move on. So there is the archive. In the middle of it at the front, you see a Norwegian notebook, which is an interesting thing, uh, connected with the travel 
of Wittgenstein and Skinner's visit to Norway. <coughs> um, you see the blue book there in the printed version on the left-hand side. That copy is ripped in part, in half, and it roughly corresponds to the handwritten um, copy of the blue book by Skinner, the only one with dates on it. And in um, our, that is my wife, who is the co-editor of this archive, which comes out probably February uh, next year, Springer, um, we also put parts of that handwritten manuscript of the blue book in just to show the following. Uniquely, it has the dates of the entries in it. So we've listed those with the sentences. There are about 20 appendices in our book of all these archives, the whole lot's published. And um, we have archives, archival material that is secondary but very important, uh, such as that, and various other things, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, the manuscripts are different uh, in status and connection and genre, but allow for the fact that Wittgenstein, in almost um, a polyphonic way, is doing similar but different jobs uh, with all the manuscripts. And in that sense, they belong together as connected themes from an asymmetric set of backgrounds and genre connections. And I'm quite sure, in a way, that we need to give that attention to Wittgenstein's lyricism and using different directions to explore similar things. Um, so just jumping back to Skinner, there he is as a child. This photograph, as far as we know, hasn't been seen before, apart from the family. Uh, yes, yes, he's the boy in front, sorry, yes. The American cousins and his sister Catherine on the left-hand side, about whom we know in a moment. Um, they have sent that family, uh, the family has 65 of them or so, have been extraordinarily helpful. And you can imagine the problems of cross-connecting permission with no conflict from the family. It's just um, they had um, their own history. So this is Skinner in uh, 1936 at his sister Catherine's wedding. Um, and that photograph has been reconstructed by one of the most wonderful pure mathematicians in my faculty who applies it to restoring da Vinci paintings and reconstructing wounds, um, but not by infrared, but something more impressive than that. Now, here's a lovely picture of him. As you know, there are no pictures really of Skinner at all, and that small one near the Senate House in the railings uh, is almost unrecognizable. Um, so there is Skinner's face, and it took um, that being resolved by about 2,500 times to restore it as it is in the original. Um, couldn't have been published otherwise. Note on going back to his left hand, right hand leg, um, there's a leg iron from polio sticking out, um, which is how sadly he came to die. But moving on. Um, we look at some of the dedications which, apart from one edition, but none of the English and standard editions have ever mentioned this, which I find it quite remarkable, because this sort of dedication, which is in code and German, um, it's not quite dedicated, but in the event of my demise, um, send these manuscripts to Skinner in Trinity. He will know what to do with them, which, in effect, places him rather like the literary executors, um, and editors before they existed. So it's quite important to see that that role roughly and with the personal connection developed and them living together, we've got to restore Skinner to uh, an honorable position and somehow he was written out of the history of the earlier ones. Um, no criticism intended. And when he died, um, it was a tragedy um, because of the war um, many hundreds of victims were taken into the hospital um, a few minutes before he was taken in for the annual and emergency treatment of sadly chipping bone out of his leg because of his polio. He was left and uh, died. Sorry. So here are the... Sorry about this. Look at the um, archives' contents. 
The numbers there correspond to the chapter numbers, but they are the manuscripts and all the manuscripts. And the first two chapters are to do with um, my introduction and our second chapter, the archival analysis of the contents and form and genres and paper, type of paper, which is uh, a research tool for people. You see the pink book, um, which stands free as an hitherto unknown copy um, of a genre, a type, and um, it's self-contained in a very interesting way. One instance is the following. If you compare the handwritten, unpublished Skinner version of the blue book, which is half of the book, um, together with the dates, you find that there are certain sentences in that, green, in that blue book which are not in any version of the published, i.e. Reese's copy. So in that perspective then, we find that the, some of the sentences that are missing from the green book, uh, the blue book rather, are inserted in this pink book. So there's obviously a dynamical evolving of uh, genre classification going on there. Um, the chapter four is the section of the brown book manuscript, which is um, the first time it's been published. So the background is this. The whole of the brown book manuscript in handwritten form is in the archive that we publish. Um, Joachim suggests that I uh, edit the blue and the brown books again in a new edition because of the importance of these things. But we thought for now, whatever happens with that, that we would publish all the material um, in the brown book manuscript of Skinner Wittgenstein, which hasn't been published or seen before. That constitutes, in chapter four, 65 manuscript pages. And it's um, where we find I'll just move forward, sorry, whoops. This is the start of the brown book and there are six volumes in it. So it isn't split into two, that's a later or artificial development. It seems that Ambrose who um, made a copy, uh, went away, did have some access, asked for to borrow Skinner's um, notes as she called them and the word notes is used here but recall these notes are remarks and are numbered in the Brown Book. So that goes back to my earlier reference to the role of and def definition note in relation to remark, but more of that in a moment or two. But what we have here is this Brown Book and the last half of volume five and the whole of volume six, which ends halfway through, um, those last two parts are in the Skinner edition that we're publishing with Springer and they've never been seen before. Now although at the end of the Skinner uh, manuscript of the Brown Book, it says here, you notice the end of the Brown Book that's published, it ends with the mirror. And here written in a strange English which is almost like some German badly written, ended of printed version. Um, then what happens is that um, it starts with the proposition one, remark one again, and the 65 pages start. And those are unique. Now, the important thing about the whole archive is to know when these sort of changes of gear happen. In addition to the normal editing, Wittgenstein makes corrections. So, in the added part, Wittgenstein has added his own corrections. But notice that we, throughout the archive, every single change and correction, whether it's a, the, or anything, we put in a footnote the editor's change. Most of those are Skinner's, but often you find that on the same line, Wittgenstein has written in his own hand a correction, and the way in which these are marked with little ribbed or marks and so forth, you see that Wittgenstein has given the conventions to Skinner and Skinner seems obviously to be following Wittgenstein's instructions in his own stuff. A note, one of the manuscripts says the following, in a box which was written in, um, in um, Goodstein's hand and also one in Skinner's hand, 
And the one in Skinner's hand says, the lectures of Dr. Wittgenstein, um, which I take down, um, and are unedited. So, wonderful thing, unedited. You get to the manuscript, you find Wittgenstein editing it. So obviously Wittgenstein is working on this over quite a period. So the point about the Brown Book um, is that um, it seems to be the final premier source and exemplifies the point that Jonathan Smith made in that wonderful chapter, I'm not being patronizing, it's just a work of utter brilliance called Between the Lines. And he points out that um, it isn't always the printed type text which is the final version and this is an example of it and relates to the breakdown of Ambrose leaving the class or being ejected or whatever. And after she left the class, still in Cambridge, but also after she left the States, the editing and collaboration continues. Right, I move on a gear and just check the time. Okay. Um, we need to add a new dimension to reflect the importance of this archive. It really seems as has been said previously, it holds the status, or at least much of it, of the Blue and Brown books. And these need new investigations in various ways themselves to see what's going on. I jump in by saying one of the terms which lectures were actually two and a bit terms cover uh, the 1933-34 and here we have Wittgenstein being announced in the Cambridge University Reporter as uh, doing the course Philosophy for Mathematicians. But before you think, oh, he's coming along and telling them to do philosophy, note what Littlewood says in his 1925-1926 reprint Heffer's publication book of his lecture, The Elements of the Theory of Real Functions. I quote from the preface to the second edition, it's not in the first. It is intended to introduce third year and more advanced second year math students to the modern theory of functions. The subject matter is very abstract. The aim of the lectures indeed is to inculcate the proper attitude of enlightened simple-mindedness, remember Wittgenstein's quotes that elsewhere, by concentrating on matters that are abstract, aimed at excluding as far as possible anything that could be called philosophy. Remarkable statement. And in this book, which is still being used in the 30s, but um, Littlewood is already drafting two different sorts of uh, books on functions. Um, he has brought Wittgenstein in with Hardy's blessing, and Hardy brings him in to lecture. So there's something extremely odd going in here. A philosopher comes in. First, if in the third year, I mean, you can probably remember if you've done it the equivalent of A-levels or whatever, but imagine in the third year, a philosopher is being brought in. Even the third year people are flying by the seat of their pants to hang on. How good would it have to be to have the blessing, having rowed with Hardy, and Hardy, of course, in his 1929 lecture, comes to, from Oxford to Cambridge and gives a lecture in which a third of it bombs Wittgenstein about um, a conjecture. And Wittgenstein has said it's not a conjecture, it's not the theorem as Hardy was calling to the lecture, it's a theorem. And there are all sorts of very technical reasons why Wittgenstein was arguing this. Imagine Hardy coming back in 29, giving part of his lecture, which was published, the Reed Lecture, the same series that C.P. Snow wrote, The Two Cultures, uh, and he's giving Wittgenstein the time of the day. So we've got to revise our notion of how much Wittgenstein understood there's a difference between doing these calculations and understanding them as a philosopher, but to understand them as someone who is virtually able to understand the mathematical proof to the extent of telling third-year students how to keep philosophy out raises some very fascinating issues. And we really need to push this, not as a distraction, but this is how Wittgenstein was thinking in the 1930s. And recall, of course, that when he was given his fellowship, He'd had brainstorming sessions for a term with Littlewood at the request of the council after Russell had written, frankly, a rather shitty reference for Wittgenstein's fellowship. So what happens is Littlewood says in the report to the council, um, 
If you think the Tractatus was an important work, my own view is that what he's going to produce is more important than the Tractatus. Now, he is speaking not only as someone who understood logic of the day and had quoted in those lectures functions Bertrand Russell's Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy. Um, he knew exactly what was going on. So Wittgenstein was brainstorming on the frontiers of mathematics. Now, we've got to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this, and it really should revolutionize our understanding I'm not suggesting that Wittgenstein is mathematicizing philosophy, nor offering a system, but this is a crazy new type of perspective which is central to Wittgenstein concerning surprise, counterintuition, the unexpected, and where he was taking this sense of patterns, which Hardy called them, into something new. And those patterns were games, so he's telling Hardy, a far better term you should use in your course, now in the fourth edition of um, course on pure mathematics, is not patterns, they are, but we want a game, but a game in a very deep sense that Bio, Leo rather, had uh, started introducing, and which is now central. It is the subject Ramsey K theory, it is really Ramsey theory, it is a whole area of combinatorics, and so. The point to hang on to here is <clears throat> that even where you're in familiar areas of advanced mathematics at this level, there's a fundamental difference between clever mathematicians, often professors, even in Cambridge, and the few, like Hitler, especially Littlewood, and to a lesser extent Hardy, they are discontinuous with. They are crazy. They are brainstormers. They start with bits of paper. They are doing math that never can be computerized. And this is a professional judgment. Between 57 and 60 or 70 percent of the mathematics today will never, in principle, ever be computerized because there are proofs saying it is impossible. And only one or two percent of that may be wrong, but keep in mind that the whole area of higher mathematics is not where you can de derive without thinking, without original construction. Um, what the proof is. So I now move on quickly, having laid that on purpose in some detail, uh, to an example in the archive which is untypical and strange and queer. And uh, <clears throat> there are sheets, if you lay the calculation out, and these are in the um, last chapter of the edition on purpose, they are a proof of Fermat's Little Theorem. In itself, a fairly obvious standard thing. But before you draw judgment, and that's the final word, remember what I was saying previously. The proof is, is in its length is at least the length of this. To a very famous, I won't name, professor who is a specialist in this area, I showed him the proof. And I took this last page, which is the answer, out. And he said, what the, is this crazy proof? I mean, it obviously something to do with Fermat's little theorem. Where's it going? He recommended, and other more standard figures have, that I should publish this because no one has ever seen this proof, which is in the appendix. Why? It's rather like saying, we have blind man's buff as a game, and um, we'll blindfold you and dumb, and then spin you around and leave you in London to find the donkey in Cambridge. In other words, the proof, which could have been standard, straight, and the part of, the point of the little theorem, you don't need to understand maths for this, is it's a straightforward thing. There's a short, shortcut Euler discovered where you can do wonderful mathematics. So the point then is that in this particular context, it's obviously got the imprint of Wittgenstein saying to Skinner, try this, try that. So the route to the proof of Fermat's little theorem is a crazy route. It's trying to avoid the idea of proof, but it ends getting there. So when, for this professor of mathematics, who was a specialist, I put that in the table and said, oh, bugger you, Arthur, that's a trick. I see where it's going. Now, if someone with that insight 
That's why it's in the appendix. It's not central to Wittgenstein's philosophy. It is Wittgensteinian in a sense, so I leave that. Um, <clears throat> here are some examples of Wittgenstein laying out his stall in some areas which is not just to do with maths. So the summary so far is this. Maths of this sort is not logic. Some of it can be logicized. Um, that's not the point. He's with pure mathematicians who are taking him elsewhere. And this is where a pattern of the games of his sense of his new philosophy comes. It overlaps in a strange sort of way with the tractatus, but it's not tautological. It's not reduction, it can't be reduced to it. But somehow Wittgenstein, in lecturing on the tractatus in one of the lecture courses, the whole of which is in the um, edition that we're publishing, is playing around with it. Superficially to a logician, or one I know, very distinguished, so well, tossing things around on the top of the table. But as Bernard Williams said to me in a completely different context, knock some of the counters off the table and see what happens. Um, and that's how some, by the way, got a professorship because all the rest were showing in their interviews a clever trick. So in that particular context, I've just given you a few examples. Taken as a piece of calculus, the TF calculus is as dull and useless as any other. Whoops, he's saying that in the 30s. And he's going around with proofs and argument. We are tempted to think a geometrical investigation is like looking at a piece of chalk and investigating. This is the idea that mathematics is sort of physics, junk. Um, this is logic I must talk about. Oh, sorry, I, there's a translation. That should be, this is mathematics I must talk about. But he said it's logic, but then he's say, playing a game. What's the logic of maths? Where he's going is the following. It was expected that with Frege, you would generalize from logic to cover the whole of maths. With Russell's paradox and all the other things, it's shrinking even to a smaller corner of set theory. As wonderful and fecund as it is, it is no basis for maths at all. So where Wittgenstein is going with various people, with Raman and Jan in the background, with little woodworking, and Turing at the time in Cambridge, an undergraduate, being his company as a first year undergraduate onwards, at Mathematical Trinity Society meetings. Um, he's playing around and feeling, where do we go with this? One of the great difficulties, which is in logic, was this, was, what is the criterion for being a proposition of being a proposition of logic? You'd think it would be pretty obvious. No. If you bring in surprise and counterintuition and Fermat's last great theorem and problems of what proof is, People like John Conway, and read a book by him of Sh written by Sean, Siobhan Roberts, you will find that game theory and logic has now gone into pure maths and it is unbelievably crazy and weird and asymmetric and non-algorithmic. In other words, it's rather like mentality. It's by definition non-algorithmic. And don't be tricked by saying that we can do algorithms, we can couch our thoughts in algorithmic thought. Turing's going to say in a radio talk in 1951 <clears throat> that um, you will never, imposs it is impossible to computerize the mind. I right, leave that on one side. Wittgenstein is having thoughts like this. By some, the proposition of logic, by some it was taken to be self evidence. Remember Euclid? Remember the history? First four theorems, um, axioms, self evident. That's what Russell was saying. Rationality is self-evident. Wittgenstein is questioning that, as others were. I mean, Ramanujan was just, had shown that this was nonsense. Of course, it was already happening in 1703. There was an attempt in Italy to formalize spheres, axiom five onwards in Euclid. Went through the whole system, collapsed towards the end. And of course, Riemann, oddly not acknowledging that earlier work, took it further and you got the Riemann conjecture and curved space time and all that sort of stuff. And it's interesting that Einstein in the theory of general, in general relativity takes up Riemann, oddly doesn't acknowledge him early on, he should have done, but does something else with it. I'm jumping sideways, but you would think that um, special relativity gets Nobel Prize, 
it could have been worked out within five to 20 years, um, I'm told, and certainly you agree, um, if someone else had you know, done it. General relativity, it still isn't fully understood. It's yielding more and more refined proofs in pure mathematics. There's now a subject of pure mathematics, of which the greatest exemplar is Michaelis de Fermos, who is extraordinary, but it's showing a yield that goes well beyond itself. Where am I going? Because Wittgenstein is bringing up self-evidence because self-evidence as a project in mathematical proof and in geometry, but also in logic, had crashed. So he's questioning what it is. And he was taken by some to be self-evidence. This was what both Russell and Frege said. Frege had a most extraordinary theory. This is an example of greatness in a mistake. Whoops. I will talk about in what sense Russell's proposition about generality are tautologies. Uh, Kant couldn't be in mathematics of the sort we're talking about now. I will talk about what has been said, that I showed that mathematics consisted of tautologies. This is nonsense. So he's saying what he said was nonsense. It's very interesting. Um, the truth is extremely simple, that this which I am doing is a bit of mathematics in contrast with logic. And then he says, a logical proposition of the sort he's thinking about has nothing to do with self-evidence. So I move on quickly. It's all right. So <clears throat> we move into the pink book. And the pink book is dealing with this. Notice that Wittgenstein in the archive, but when you now go back to the brown book, that's published in the form published, and other parts, um, he's screwing around with narrative jumps from pure maths to logic to narrative, and he will pop in narrative, um, some maths. Here's a project which was alluded to, but not in the form I'm suggesting it now, but the person obviously sensed it in some earlier talk, is this. Go through all his lecture notebooks, and even some of the queer remarks you know how he said two years before Skinner died, I wish he was dead. You think, was that in a private note to a priest? No, it's slap in the middle of philosophy. So he merges those sort of genres. Now think of this. In the lecture notes, hitherto really ignored are mathematical examples at the bottom of the page. And people largely wouldn't know the maths he's doing. We must go back and look at those. I know Briggs and other people have done honorable work, but it needs a whole new approach because what he's doing is um, conjecturing and developing illustrations and how does a mathematical, pure mathematical illustration relate to the mind. You don't need to understand much math to do that but we need some guidance from pure mathematicians and applied mathematicians on this. But in the middle of all this he will suddenly in the pink book slap into this um, statement and um, that was his handwriting it's a typical example in the pink book of him suddenly banging in a large um, handwriting paragraph, which is on the opposite page with an instruction to insert. It is extremely interesting that very often when people say that science has not yet discovered this or that, but if X had discovered it then, dot, 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 that they very often don't know at all what sort of discovery they are waiting for, that they talk of a discovery without knowing what nature this discovery would be. For example, when people say that one day when psychology will go far enough developed and it will make us understand the nature of beauty. He's alluding to Schopenhauer in the previous paragraph and the opening book line of the um, pink book is a reference to Schopenhauer but not the sort that you find in the alleged yellow book nor elsewhere. It, so he's mapping in rather in the way Joachim said uh, geography you get low, you walk down, run around the lanes and travel in them, then get up in the stratosphere. And Wittgenstein's up in the stratosphere saying, basically, how does aesthetics and Schopenhauer relate to the experiment I'm just about to do? And of course, he goes off eventually to Newcastle after guys and does them a few years later. So playing around with this isn't a craziness that's wild, patchy, where's he going? He's on a conscious journey which, in the nature of discovery, it takes him somewhere. I'm okay? Yeah. yeah I'm Fine, thank you. Um, in that particular context today, we ask questions like this. What would it be in principle not to understand the physics in the multiverse in a universe with another uh, signature? People like Martin Rees 
I've asked these sort of questions, and he's saying, I don't know. And then you say, well, if you don't know, and you mean in principle, I said to him, um, you mean you can't use numbers? What the hell does that mean? It means even if you had a million years to r understand what a, a future civilization does, are you saying in principle you don't understand them? Because we have computers, we have number theory, wouldn't we catch up? Some of the points seem to say no halting problems. Paradoxes show that within mathematics, there are non-mathematical aesthetic identities. I mean, this is a very deep problem. Wittgenstein is touching on that sort of stuff. And of course, some of the pure mathematicians are already thinking about this. So, so now. And then he says something like this. But can one see all the rules of geometry of the cube just by seeing the cube? Now, if you suddenly say, well, what on earth is going on? Is this all right? No, it isn't. You don't say that. You've got to be starting now to have a good sense of geometry. It doesn't follow from a knowledge of geometry at a certain level that you're getting anywhere. And the link is the following. We will only yet say that ge geometrical propositions say nothing about cubes. What the hell is he talking about? Because he's going to the meta language, the metadata of what it is to be geometry, which is in a way is discontinuous and working at a level. Here's an example. Um, now this is in the section called philosophy, a series of lectures, all of these in the edition. So we've got there a cube containing a cone. It's a slightly odd cube, it's almost a square, but it's projected. Now, basically, what's happening is this. I can't go into the background, but I'll fill it in quickly. In 1934, Hardy, Littlewood, and Polly, with visits from various parts of Europe and later um, the States, are working on inequalities. What is limit theorem? What are the limits? In other words, what happens when you start not dealing with propositions like P or not P, um, it's not just probability, it's when calculation itself is breaking down, or as with pi, we're now up to 10 trillion numbers beyond the decimal point, and there's still no regularity. It's an extraordinary paradox that in something that can be calculated so precisely at a rough level, we haven't the faintest idea how to close that into a real theorem. And here he's starting to deal with that sort of thing. We're not saying he understands all the technical ramifications, but remember, Turing, as an undergraduate, didn't. <clears throat> what he then does is he jumps sideways in this chapter and says, I'm now proposing to distinguish between intentional and unintentional by saying the unintentional projection is when he draws the right shape without going through the process of drawing the rays, those dots. Where is he going? We can't spend time on this. He's using geometry and spherical geometry as a model for mentality and the distinction between the intention with which, i.e. Anscombe, late in later years, and intentionality. And it's an extraordinary thing. The second is a projection that's not really there. We can't dwell on that, but you can see we've got to look at this. You don't need to understand maths. Just look at that and start saying there is something here. It's not mathematizing. The philosophy of mind is saying, get a feel of how wild it is in this area position and be much more adventurous. So <clears throat> I've got to finish. Bugger. OK. Um, he says later in the pink book, what the possible processes which could be carried out computing number. The arguments which I shall use are of three kinds. A direct appeal to intuition. That's actually Turing in his 1936 paper. Three years later, two years later, right before that, Wittgenstein, three years before that paper is written, Wittgenstein is lectured on all this. And there are 26 phrases and the repeat a number of times of possible processes and intuition in Wittgenstein's lectures in the Pink Book and earlier on the Brown Book. Remember um, the piano with the paper, um, all that Turing has absorbed. And this is why Turing sends one of four papers when he writes it in Princeton to Wittgenstein to check. And that's why a year later, he draws in Alistair Watson, who's working for SIS and the intelligence services doing 
an attempt to work out codes. So Wittgenstein has helped Turing. And he concludes with this. The way to understand this is to split up the possible processes into games. He's saying this in the pink book a few years before Turing writes his stuff. So Turing, I'm saying, has been trained in a way by Wittgenstein, and Wittgenstein um, is a pioneer of that particular sort. We can't really go on with this, but I just want to round off and suggest that I've raced through to give you a feel of the richness of the archive, and there's an awful lot more, and we need to rethink, not rip anything up, but build on a new sense of adventure, and it's summarized in the following expression. Um, not self-evident surprise, which is psychological if you're playing logic, but not psychological if you're looking at the nature of mathematics outside a system. It is surprise all the way down and up. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this inspiring talk. Uh, comments? Questions? One has to collect one's. Uh, oh, I said. Rearrange, <laughs> actually, <laughs> rearrange one's uh, look at things. Oh, sorry, well, um, I don't apologize, but I do apologize. I suppose the silence could mean it's a pile of junk, of course. Mm -hmm. That's it. There are a lot of genres in, in Wittgenstein's manuscripts, and uh, it's really a way of see, saying that the second philosophy is as deep as the Tractatus. And it might be worthwhile seeing, making a comment, if I may, on how he sees the Tractatus. It's so easy, and I'm not suggesting because there are experts here uh, on the Tractatus, and I very much respect their insights. <clears throat> what Wittgenstein does, he already had been doing work in connection with pure mathematicians and contacting them and going to conferences when he was writing the Tractatus or notes and so forth, insofar as you could. So I think how he views the Tractatus and how perhaps we should view it is as an instrument of exploration in the way in which, without overdoing this, a, um, a mathematician today gets a model and he knows it would possibly be the future. It may be a new form of geometry and he over-condenses the initial form to get a bite and an understanding of what the provisional insight is, which is what Einstein did cosmological constant, stuffed it in, didn't understand. Thought Mach's principle was in terms of relativity. He got that wrong, adjusted. So the Tractatus, I think we should view as an extraordinary work of sublime genius, and uh, that, here's the point, it is a model that goes beyond the sum of its parts. And he knew that in the way he's drafting it. He's struggling with the limits um, I, I think in some way uh, you are the one who uh, came up with a surprise to the audience uh, uh, because uh, the, the presentations we had up to now uh, were straight mathemat mathematics, so to speak, uh, namely bibliography, uh, edition stuff uh, 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 about manuscripts and uh, their provenance and things like that. Now you jumped in. Uh, and obviously, uh, one of your guiding motives uh, is that there is something interesting in there. Uh, and um, uh, you picked out um, uh, particular features uh, of the material uh, uh, to elaborate uh, on them. So it takes uh, a certain time uh, yes. uh, for us to digest uh, uh, this sort of attitude. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm very, I, I, I myself uh, uh, think uh, uh, there are two ways, like, uh, I, I mean, quite, uh, the 
uh, the majority of the presentations were uh, slow step, slowly stepping uh, from some part of the evidence uh, uh, to questioning whether there might be an importance uh, on a more general picture. Now you reversed uh, this thing. Uh, you had this idea of what's the most important general uh, idea is, and under these uh, presuppositions, uh, you presented us uh, mm -hmm. uh, with an overview of um, of the corpus. Uh, I think, I, could I just respond to that and say yeah. thank, thank you? Two. Yeah, we've yeah. Got, yeah. yeah, say uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't apologize it for, of course, it wasn't perfect, um, and it's very difficult to know quite what to say when the things are so rich. Um, I'd like to add this point, that um, my wife and I, and Neve is a, a Russianist, who's looked at the poems that Wittgenstein wrote about the time of Pushkin and so forth, but um, she is also a professional editor so the edition, I hope, is at least as meticulous as anything else. So it isn't that we just sort of plastered revolutionary stuff through it. Uh, this is the outcome of the edition, and the edition has an awful lot in it. And so the, for example, I'll finish off here, the footnotes are internal to the book in a rather odd way, because the footnotes, apart from documentary references and so forth, are largely to say, this is what the corrections are. These are the revisions. So the, the footnotes are internal to show how the manuscript, if you're not just going to have a photograph of the manuscript, but a transposition and transcription of the manuscript, all the even smallest alterations are there in the footnotes. So we tried to do a meticulous job of editing as well. Yeah. So have it both ways. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Or jack of all trades. <laughs> Um, thank you, Arthur, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm taken by the phrase of discontinuous pattern um, that, that you articulated, um, and I think that matches well with the last kind of phrase that you left us with, which is not self-evident but surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So this element of, um, of breakage or of um, diversion from a, per, from a predicted pattern or from a predicted path mm -hmm. and things like that, um, it got me thinking about a few things. So one is the notion that the, the sort of logical question of inference is something that Wittgenstein in various iterations, in various pathways, in various subjects continues to struggle with or continues to try to get a hold of. Um, and here too, the question of inference then I think is a similar one as those phrases illustrate, which is you have an expected pattern, but to what extent is that reliable? Um, at what point does that break down? Um, so that maybe is more of a, of a uh, observation than, than a question, but the question then comes how you think about understanding Wittgenstein's content as being something having to do with the, with the problem of a discontinuous pattern, how that then relates to his own very complex editing process. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain temporality, right? There's a timeline that is sometimes very difficult to suss out, as we've seen and talked mm -hmm. about over the last day and a half, um, in terms of his editing process. and is in some ways what we're trying to do to find how the pattern <laughs> happened. And maybe what we're missing is that sometimes it was just discontinuous. Well, I think all the scholars I know working in the Wittgenstein, certainly these here, and for example, Bernd's um, presentation is revelatory in a way. And um, it's the sense of if you have a certain cast of mind of openness, or even nervous, where am I in the universe? That sort of thing is how Wittgenstein is, and he's lost himself, but he's lost as a polymath. In fact, Sir Michael Atiyah, who almost solved the Riemann um, conjecture and died recently, um, he, um, extraordinary man, he was Master of Trinity College, pre President of the Royal Society, um, over in Princeton, trustee and all that sort of stuff, utterly brilliant, utterly fast and frighteningly brilliant. Um, he used to come back to Cambridge and retire to Edinburgh, but even before he did, he'd say, I'm appearing in the Potter Room, Arthur. Appear yourself. So I'd go along and throw things at him. And it usually was, so what about Wittgenstein now? And the last conversation I had with him a couple of years ago was typical. It's very important because this mathematician did not theory, um, you know, string theory, didn't believe it, but did it. And, He's breaking through. And he said, 
Remember this, Arthur, the 1915 article about intuitionism that he read isn't right, but there's something in it that Wittgenstein spotted, and I personally, Michael Etiar said, and he was an egoist, a really big egoist. He didn't normally say this thing about anybody. He said, Wittgenstein probably, in that insight, ha is the single person, as a polymath, that's what he said, who has the clue about how we would derive the new logic from pure and applied maths. Now, that may be wrong, but for someone like that to say it, and it made me think of the following, a beautiful thing which has been pointed out by a number of um, philosophers of Wittgenstein, and it's this. Wittgenstein, in the context of this thing that Brian McGuinness says is the euthyphro dilemma, um, is like, do I chew gum and talk? But it is, do I write or speak? And I think Wittgenstein could not write, he was thinking. And in that context, um, Drury's remarks on Wittgenstein on music, which are known, but have been republished in that edition, um, blessed by Paul Drury, his son, with whom he and I had discussions about this, um, uh, when he's director of cosmic physics in uh, Dublin. He said, look at these new remarks about music, Arthur, because my father thought that was the point. And it all centered on that wonderful sentence, which is this. Sorry, I'm carefully placing it. Me thinking, and anybody thinking of genuinely, whether it's a tramp or a mathematician or a scientist, the new thought is so fragile, deep within us. It's like hearing a, a note of music and the slightest disturbance from within and from the audience without, he might have said, but he did say, or without, loses it forever. And he was like that. And uh, this is um, Frege, you know, on the railway station. Look, Frege, do you really understand what you say? Mm -hmm. On good days, mm -hmm. I still think I do. Mm -hmm. And you find that not just aging genius mathematicians, but quite younger ones, like Berker, who's just got the Fugue Prize, extraordinarily exquisite chap. Um, a refugee, and uh, with him, he's got a fragile sensibility, and yet he's recovered a whole new area. So what I'm trying to say is, for example, Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, first movement, last movement, suddenly it goes, dun, 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 dun. and you think that's like a great, it might be a, a great farmer having a sense of when it's going to rain, but what Beethoven is saying is, have you seen the pattern behind that? And it's not until you get to the third movement you realize this man's really crazy. It's the heroic sympathy, symphony, rather. And, um, sorry, and then you, what you've got to do is realize that he's, as a as professional in this area told me a couple of days ago when I raised the point, he said, of course he's thinking about the ballet music he designed that's meant to complement it rather like Wittgenstein, writing this genre as I've drawn. I'm sorry I've given a long answer, but. Uh, Alois, uh, Alois. Sorry, Alois. Uh, well, I, I have a very unclear and speculative question to ask, so thank you for your talk. I wonder whether you could share with us some thoughts, even only speculations about how Wittgenstein's philosophical and personal development would have gone on if Skinner hadn't died in 1941, mm. and what it would maybe have changed for, yes, yes. for the works he has yes. produced and so on. Yes. Well, I think the background to that, I think I'd have a go. Um, it, struck, yeah, thank you. It, it struck me even more coming to Vienna and Austria for the first time. No, I went to Graz, but Vienna is obviously the place. It's wonderful. And uh, it's naive of me, but I hold on to the naive, naivety as profound. The impression is it's a wonderful place. I just think what traumatic, traumatic, post-traumatic stress must the whole family of Wittgenstein have felt having supported the wrong side, as it turned out, historically in terms of success, um, before uh, you know, the, the First World War and so forth came. 
And um, so Wittgenstein being a show soldier in that time as well, um, I know from my own father, who was not an honorable person in these areas, but was a victim. And so first, to answer your question, he came from that context when he was a young man. And then he has the Second World War, and his old fellows are in the plains, you know, and uh, Skinner dies because of the bombing of the, you know, the, bombing of the Allied people. He, the Lancaster bombers were around Cambridge, and they'd bombed over in Germany and w various parts. But um, so imagine how he's thinking, and down Huntingdon Road, there's a 100-ton a uh, flame bomb bouncing down Huntingdon Road at some point, didn't go off. You know, imagine him like that. So what I'm trying to say is, your answer is, uh, your question is utterly profound, because in that context, he's in a hospital with Skinner dying. And these, his diary and uh, Schraffer's diary show his going to Schraffer to the bedside and backwards and forwards. So um, I think he was almost destroyed. So what I'm trying to say is that already as a person of singular talent, unstable mentally, nuts, as Drury said he was, and always would be, there's a certain madness in his ability as well, which works for and against. He can cut off his autistic in some sort of way, or whatever. We don't want to overplay that, but to answer your question, I think it probably almost killed him and finished him off. But still, and I think therefore it, it maimed him in a way. Yeah, if he had, so the answer to, thank you, sorry, thank you, Neil. You're quite right, sorry. Um, I'm laying the foundation of the answer to the question in terms of the answer too much. I apologize. So the answer is this. I think he would have gone on to um, be a wise counselor in the area of mathematics. And he would have said, Turing, do you remember, the, I'm quoting actual history here, this is not conjecture, but this is how you put it together. Do you remember Tut? Um, who until 15 years ago, he was hidden property in Trinity because of the Secret Service Act. He was behind the quantum Cree inscription and other things. Do you remember Rado, who in 1933 was at the Ma Trinity Mathematical Society, and you were there present, Turing, and I said to you, the man's got a point. And people around him, like Little would say, it's a bit of a lunatic. I mean, he's just tried to crack something instead of blasting through the error in the mathematics, he's sneaking like some rotten mouse into the castle. Wittgenstein said that to Geach, by the way, when he got a mistake, and Freud and Geach told me that. And he said, but Rado's got hold of something, keep an eye on it. Where am I going with this? What happens is that by the time Turing gets to Bletchley, the people have assembled the mathematics, and this is why I use the Fermat's little theorem in itself, nothing. But all you can do is you get to the fourth prime number in a self-evident little theorem. But no one knows what the fifth prime number is. And that bangs immediately into quantum key encryption, the secret service code, Enigma, and is still unsolved. And it's still the basis for all the bank codes. And Wittgenstein had the genius in which he'd fingered this area of the new mathematics. And so uh, you go and talk with these people now in GCHQ, and they are wanting someone like Wittgenstein, not to do the sums, to knock them around in a way. So you will be doing that. Could I add a detail, may I? Uh, very shortly, very shortly. Yeah, yes, They'd, and this is not patronizing. He would take your paper that you gave in Oxford, and I'm not saying it because you're here, it's profound, and that is you said, what is religious discourse? And he'd say, um, oh, virtually impossible. You walk in a tightrope. And these people who've said it means, I think of religious as, mm, it's primitive, it's non-propositional. He would say, you're on the right track because I really meant you should walk on that tightrope, but it's going to be surprising, counterintuitive, and seem non-propositional. The trouble is the people haven't realized that there are new sorts of propositions. He would then say the following. I recommend that you go away and work with people on dark energy because they haven't the faintest clue what a proposition of science 
on dark energy, which we demonstrated, corroborated, that it fills 75% of the universe. And we haven't the faintest idea how any of those observations will fit even a non-standard model of physics. And any that we've tried contradict all the standard models of physics and give further evidence that the bolting of the Higgs field, Higgs boson, onto stuff via CERN shows that this is not going to work. The whole standard model of physics is something beyond it. I press you people to look for new sorts of propositions that don't even see propositions, and you may end up in aesthetics doing physics. Now Sorry. It's, uh, it's completely intuitive that it's 12 o'clock, uh, and uh, that at some time, uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, My apologies. Uh, yes. And thank you again very much uh, for the all, all, all of this material uh, that you mm. put before us. Uh, and uh, so this ends uh, this morning's session. By the, by the way, could I add that the remarks after lunch will be very elementary. <laughs>